Thank you very much, Tatiana, for your wonderful introduction. And uh, let me welcome all of you in this center tonight in Riga. The real question is, what can we learn as 8 billion human beings, not as an individual, not as a family, not even as a nation or society, but what is it that 8 billion of us can learn soon enough? Until the 20th century, it turned out that we had a lot of time and a lot of opportunities to correct ourselves as human beings. But in the last 120 years, we doubled our population. And we tripled or quadrupled our mistakes. So it turns out that all the efforts made by the great teachers of the last 3,000 years, they come to test now. It seems that we are running out of time, resources, and space. And most of all, we are running out of human qualities that we really need. The question is, how can we help? The question is, is there a new and quick remedy to all of our problems? And the answer is, the remedy has always been the same. We have just failed to apply it. So knowing ourselves better, turning our energy inside, clearing our minds, that has been there as an option for thousands of years under various names, religions, practices. We've just never done that sufficiently enough. Throughout thousands of years, people have been waiting for the miracle, the ultimate miracle that would solve all the problems. That miracle has never come. Similarly, we have tried to uncover the ultimate secret. Many small secrets were uncovered, but there is no big secret that could save us. And finally, we were looking for the ultimate authority, whether up or down or even below, that can take our responsibility as well as our freedom so that we would not have to make so many bad decisions. But it turns out that this miracle, secret and authority, they do not exist in the way we want them. In fact, they do not exist at all. Instead, we would really have to know ourselves better and clear our minds to a higher quality, better clarity. And that is never too late to begin. If we don't do this, then humanity will experience an incredible amount of suffering and all that is unnecessary. It is not our destiny. This world is not a place of punishment. This world is a place which we make it to be. We are super creative and also destructive individuals. And as a species, we are capable of horrendous and fantastic things at the same time. It is always our choice. It has always been our choice. And it will always be our choice. But sometimes we fail to see that. So that not seeing is avidya. This not seeing is the root of greed, anger, and ignorance. And the path to enlightenment means that we ask the right question so that we would get the right answers. We walk on the path out of suffering instead of making it worse. So everybody heard about meditation or some kind of spiritual practice, and some of you are practicing, I know that. There are thousands and thousands of techniques. But the number one, the primary technique, is that you are courageous enough to see. You are brave enough to look inside. And you accept the results as first hand, but you are ready to change them. If you are not ready to change yourself, you cannot change the world. The Avatamsaka Sutra says, if you want to understand the nature of this world, then perceive it as created by mind alone. So how do we do that? Strangely enough, this experience comes by not doing anything inside. You don't think willfully. You don't make feelings willfully. You do not go back to the past or the future forward. And you are not making an alternative present either. What we are doing is actually coming back to this point that we call this moment. Some people in the West confuse this not doing with laziness, and that is fundamentally wrong. 
Some other people in the West confuse emptiness with nothingness, and that is also plain wrong. When you look at the original term of Wu Wei or non-action, it means that you do not make any dualities in your mind. You do not make any further karma in your mind because you do not talk, you do not act, you do not think willfully or feel willfully. You just perceive. Similarly, the term shunyata does not mean nothingness. It means complete emptiness or empty completeness. And if you look at it like that, we come back to the ultimate paradox that we have to come back to the mirror that sees. We have to find this one mind. And then we return to this no thinking or not doing that we call don't know. Most of us would like a very clear standpoint or holding onto a name and a form. So many people believe in God. That's wonderful. But if you look at the way they believe in God, it produces a lot of confusion because there's many images and ideas about God. And if you keep a distance, you really don't know which one is the true one and which one is fruitless. The same thing is true about enlightenment. Many people have many ideas about enlightenment or awakening, but these ideas themselves are not productive and they are not leading you to the experience, just like the images of God do not lead you to the experience of God. This is really important point. So we are back to square one, that if you want to attain the thinker, you have to stop thinking. If you want to attain who you truly are, you have to take away all the ideas and self-images about yourself. If you want to attain God, take away any ideas about God. And if you want to wake up, then take away any ideas about awakening. And after a while, this seems quite natural. We have to walk the path because we cannot talk the path. You may say this sounds very nice as some philosophy or spiritual discipline. What do I get out of this? Well, what you get out of this is clarity, a mind which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. In this mind, you can see your karma, you can see your choices, and you can make better decisions because if you see the outcome or steps, many, many steps of many outcomes, then you will be better informed about the consequences of your speech, action, thoughts, and feelings. So we are back to the original teaching of Buddha Shakyamuni himself, who talked about suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. It's the Four Noble Truths. And to apply them, you really need clarity. If you don't have that, you don't even see the fact of suffering. The Buddha talks about human beings who are attached to this body and identify with their karma as children playing in the burning house. They don't know about it. And now, 8 billion of us, we don't seem to know about it. We don't seem to perceive that we are running out of time. We don't seem to perceive that we do not have to suffer and make each other suffer. We can see the cause, we can see the end, and we can walk the path to end the suffering. This is why the original teaching does not talk about love, happiness, fulfillment, welfare, right away. We all want that. Human beings are really predictable. We are looking for all these values that I have just mentioned, and we want to avoid war, poverty, enmity, hatred, etc., etc., etc. But until we have cleared the house, we cannot do it. Why did you hear this original teaching from Jesus himself that new wine has to go into new barrels? Because if we don't clear ourselves of our previous karma, we can never attain these high human qualities that I have just mentioned and all teachers mention in their own way. So we have to do the hard work of cleaning the house and then put the new furniture inside.
So I think uh, this was enough for introductory and I'll be very happy and honored to receive your questions and try to answer them. So who has any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, what do you mean by saying that uh, we are running off time, that we have little time left? If you look at just our known history of the last, let's say, 2,500, 3,000 years, we've had many empires. We've had the Assyrian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Habsburg Empire, and lately you can see what big countries are doing. What is interesting that these empires were coming and going, rising and falling, but none of them exhausted the resources of Mother Earth as we have done in the 20th century and as we keep continuing that in the 21st century. So largely until like 1960, 1980, we did not even have a concept of wrecking our environment and destroying this Earth. Now this imperial appearance and disappearance became so big, so damaging, so consuming, so greedy, so angry, that the very environment which we used to renew ourselves and get the next chapter going in our human lives, that's in danger. This environment that we used for our living, for our living and dying, for appearing and disappearing, this environment is in grave danger. Okay? And it's not me who says that. Everybody with some knowledge and understanding cause and effect, either scientific or other types or psychological cause and effect, they can confirm. You can do your own research, but it's pouring from every faucet, every channel that something is very wrong. If you don't fix it soon enough, then we will completely finish the chance of renewal at this level. Renewal will be possible, but with way more suffering than before. We can avoid that, and we should avoid that. Not for ourselves, but for our children, grandchildren, and those generations who will hold us accountable, asking mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, what did you do to this earth where I was born? What did you do to this planet, to this human society, which has to last to my children, for my grandchildren? They will be asking those questions. Already they appeared. Next question, anyone? What do you think if we, okay, if we use the resources, is it really possible to stop and uh, use the other type of resources? But if we do not sufficiently do this, or we don't, don't use other resources, we, <laughs> do we really have to go and, and to leave? Or, I mean, to leave the planet? There are two kinds of resources. One is external, like water, air, soil, wood, minerals, etc. And there are internal resources. In Zen, we first talk about internal resources. I've mentioned a few. Clarity, perception, courage, doing the right thing at the right time, refraining from doing the wrong things. So internal resources is really important. So we have to mobilize our internal resources first. Without that, the external resources will never be ours. When I was a kid, we went to the forest around Budapest many times after rain. Imagine a 60 kilometer radius around the city lots of beautiful hills and mountains. We picked mushrooms. And at that time, if you picked mushrooms and you went to the market, there were these expert mushroom people who could really check whether you picked the right one or not. And I'm walking as a kid with my family, with my friends, and they pick mushrooms that I bypass. I had my eyes open. I also wanted to pick them. I never saw them. I had no experience in picking mushrooms. And I didn't have the image in my mind what I want. They did know what they wanted. So they were looking inside their minds first. They had the right mushroom image and that mushroom 
immediately appeared for them, but not for me. I just took a walk. I helped, you know, carry the sack later. But they found the mushrooms because inside they already understood. They already saw. So the internal resources were first, so the external appeared. I don't believe that at this stage, even if we found another planet like Earth, that would help us in the long run. We would completely destroy that planet too. We would do the same thing. Exactly. So many people believe that maybe aliens or a new planet or some divine intervention could save us. No, we should save ourselves and each other from suffering. In fact, I don't see any other option, real viable option, just this. Wake up and save all beings from suffering, including yourself. And that's why internal resources first, external resources next. But if you don't find it inside, it will never appear on the outside. And even if it does, we can't keep it, we can't use it. And most importantly, we cannot offer it to other people. I understand that uh, it's important to help other beings, uh, but, and we have to clear our mind. But how to do that if, if I understand that I have my own uh, delusions and my mind is not clear enough? So how can I help those beings? This is a very, very wonderful and important question. The Buddha said, wake up and save all beings from suffering. This imperative has two parts. One is awakening. That's why we practice. That's why we meditate every day. That's why we perceive our mind moment to moment. If we didn't do that, we would be ignorant. We would be blind. So perception, clarity, meditation practice, they go hand in hand. And if we don't do it, then our qualities are not different from those who need saving, who really need assistance. And next is once we have reached sufficient clarity, then you will help. You will help even without anyone asking you. Why? Because you see that somebody else's suffering is your suffering. We call that compassion. Compassion is not just an emotional standpoint. You see that if you don't help this world, the rest of the world will suffer. You may live well. You will be okay. But somebody else's suffering will break your door, will destroy your house, will invade your country. Personal liberation seems to be very important for a lot of people. What some people do not realize is that personal liberation is impossible without helping all other beings. The two are intimately connected. And the reverse is also true. If you want to help all beings, then you have to have personal liberation from your own greed, anger, and ignorance. If I have this wish to help uh, my nearest, my, my relatives, my, my kids. But what to do if they resist my help? They, they, don't, they turn their back, they don't want it. How can I help? Is it enough just to do chanting? So you're saying that some of your family members uh, or relatives need your help, but uh, you also see that they are not ready to receive it. So chances are that they are not really ready to get what you are prepared to give. In this case, you can wait. And this patience pays off because you do not want to intrude into their lives or activities, but you are ready to help if they make a mistake. If they hit their heads against the wall, they will bleed and you will be the first to offer the bandage. So stand by and be patient. If you are patient, you can get two very important benefits. One is that they will respect you because you don't touch their lives, you don't form any opinions, and you don't judge them. That's one. Second, chances are that if they don't want your help, then at some point they will not need it. Then you will help someone else. But if they do need your help and they are not ready to take it, then the only way is to wait and watch and stay ready. And when they have made the mistake that you have foreseen, but they have not foreseen, they will love and respect you for the help that you are giving them. Before that, they would say, hands off, don't touch me, don't talk to me, 
don't have any judgment or opinion over me because they are not aware of what you are already aware of. Sometimes we really do not see cause and effect ahead. Some others, they do. But if they interfere too soon, we reject that. So that's why patience pays off, because they do not build up a resistance, a defense towards you. Then you are still in the position of trust, and then they will invite you to help when it's necessary. So continuing this will, willingness to help, for example, our kids, how far should we go uh, with this waiting? And I remember your talk about kids. Uh, they were shown uh, how the car accident can happen if you drive drunk. So what can happen? But if I'm parent, uh, how long can I wait, for example? How far should I go? So the previous answer was about adults or those people who consider themselves adults. Children, especially your children, are a totally different ballgame. You don't want them to damage themselves, injure themselves or others. When you have children, then you, of course, pull them away from harm's way. And that's clear. But at some point, they need some demonstration which makes them believe you. I remember that uh, over 15 years ago, I was invited to teach at a penitentiary institution that was a jail, the kind of second most serious maximum security facility in the town of Seged, south of Budapest, like 200k. How the teaching went is another matter, but what I saw at that time got really etched in my mind. As I was going in, depositing all my valuables, mobile phone, you name it, you just had your clothing on yourself and you went in. You get a little beeper, if there's a problem, you can press it and wait for help. But a group of high school students, they were coming out of the jail after a demonstration what it means to be locked up for a long time. And their faces, and they were like 15, 16 years old, just showed everything. So yeah, we have to learn a lot uh, at school, but school trips, excursions, demonstrations of various areas of life, these are really important. So demonstrate what it means to be convicted and put into jail. I guarantee that those high school kids, unless they were really, really strongly for criminal life in their minds, they would never do that. Their faces reflected the entire experience. It wasn't fear or horror, just this sheer disbelief that such life can exist on Earth. And that's what made them totally just blank. Some of them, like little girls were a little bit crying, boys were kind of losing focus and talking to each other. And it was a really important trip. So imagine that into various areas of life, you would have this demonstration. Like, I would love to take traffic offenders, like violators who are speeding and they get a ticket, to two places, in fact three. One is a junkyard where you only have cars that were crashed. And you see crashed cars one after the other, all of them. And in the picture you will still have the blood on the chassis, okay? The second is a hospital with the ICU, the intensive care unit, where first responders, they bring the injured. Look at that. See how people are suffering who are either the victims or the perpetrators of these accidents. And then the next is the cemetery, because some people die. And whatever remains is just represented by a gravestone, and that's it. In Hungary, some of these roadside graves are the best deterrents, because you can see the name of the person who died there. Sometimes you can see the candles on the anniversary. And if you know how the road goes, you see how and why that accident must have happened when people didn't pay attention, when they were not mindful of the conditions and the other vehicles. So demonstration helps. And it, this can go a long way. Like around the same time, I had access to a rehab facility where those drug addicts who became physically clean learned how to live in society again. So the mental cleansing was 
the leftover task, and that was pretty big. And I taught both places in the penitentiary and in the rehab, meditation, to look inside and find a better version of yourself. The rehab is something that I would have every teenager who thinks about, you know, smoking pot or going, you know, higher on the very crucial ladder of consuming drugs, see what happens to addicts, see what happens to those people who can't handle it, and decide it for yourself whether you want to go down that way or not. Those facilities are excellent teachers. So I've just named a few of these walks of life where you can take your kids for a trip. It's like the Buddha taking a trip outside of the palace where he was totally secure, forgetting about suffering and life and death and ups and downs. And he saw the dead man, the sick man, the newborn and the practitioner. So take a trip, take your children with you and see how we can live, how we should or should not live on this planet. This is excellent teaching. So right now we are living in, um, in such time that uh, vibrations of planet, uh, they are increasing. And um, there are lots of uh, information that we can go out of karma uh, or uh, out of this samskara, let's say so. What can you tell about it? Is that really possible and how to do this in your way? Yeah, you can hear and read a lot of people about the planet, the vibrations, the shifting of the poles, the change in the atmosphere or down near the core of the Earth. But other people deny that and they argue with each other. And what I want us to focus on is the vibration that we can all hear, that we can all see, because that's what we need to fix. These are the vibrations of human thinking, human speech, human emotions and human actions. These are the four channels of our personality where we interact with each other and this world the most intensively, besides the sensory functions of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, etc. These vibrations are so important that in Mahayana Buddhism, we devoted four bodhisattvas to them. So thinking, can be purified and the vibration of thinking can be so noble that it becomes non-dualistic wisdom. The representative of that is Manjushri Bodhisattva or Munsu Bosal in Korean. Compassion is the highest form of emotion and the representative of that is Avalokiteshvara or various forms of Tara, Chen Reze in Tibetan, Kwansen Bosal in Korean. Action is Deheng Boyon Bosal or Samantabhadra because most of our actions are very rudimentary or just selfish. And selfless help, correct action, is how we connect to the world correctly if we want to help each other. And speech is Kshiti Garba or Jijang Bosal in Korean because that's the speech that is in accordance with the truth. And it's either a vow or an oath at its highest level. So these vibrations, if we clear them, if we totally fix them, then we do not lie to each other, do not cheat each other, do not harm each other. And that's the key to the more subtle perceptions. So I believe that if we fix these vibrations that are the most important for us and for this planet, then we can go to the more subtle levels together and perceive the truth as it is. So these bodhisattvas, why are they so important? Because they represent the most important functions of our personality. So when we practice, we bow to them. We call it externalization. We have a representation in space on the altar or on the tanka of our most important qualities. So when we bow, we actually purify our speech. Not just mine, yours too. Our actions, our thoughts and our emotions. And once we have done that, we internalize it again. So vibration outside comes from vibration inside. Vibration inside also is affected by vibration outside. Once we recognize this interaction between the microcosmos and the macrocosmos, we are on the right track. And that's why the externalization 
or projection is necessary first, put it into space, put it into form, put it into image, do the great job of cleansing, strengthening, tuning, and then internalize it again. That's what we call introjection again. And uh, that's why Mahayana or just one tent away is Advaita Vedanta, another tent is Zen Buddhism. From three angles, we really speak about the same issues and the same core teachings, okay? The key to that is a mind that doesn't vibrate, doesn't move, because that functions like a mirror. Imagine that you look into your own mirror in the bathroom and it's moving, it's waving, it has its own opinion, it has its own vibration, it wouldn't show your face clearly. In order for the mirror to show your face clearly, it should have no image by itself. It should be totally empty and void. Imagine that you go into the bathroom in the evening and your face from the morning would still be there. In human terms, we call it holding mind. We hold on to the past too much. Imagine that you look into the mirror, which is now clear, but as you move, your face still remains there. We call that attachment. We attach to the image. Imagine if the mirror was attached to the image, you wouldn't be able to see yourself in five seconds because the mirror would be loaded with all your faces. If the mirror wasn't completely flat, then your mirror wouldn't show your face as it is because it would have these waves in it. So one part of your face would be this big, another part would be this narrow that we call making or distortion. So during the pandemics of COVID, uh, many people become aggressive and they try to affect you negatively, to force you. So how to do with them? Keep your social distance. <laughs> That's also your safety distance. And it teaches those people something that uh, if they cannot reach you with their hands, they also cannot teach you with their minds because their minds are really limited. The more dualistic we are, the more extreme we are, the more anger, greed and ignorance we carry, the more limited we are. That's the equation. If we return to clarity, selflessness, compassion, wisdom, we walk the middle way. It's very simple. Keep your distance. And inside, don't react to them. Just perceive that space is always bigger than the bad karma in it. That's why you will always have a choice. Avoid them, connect to them. Do not react to anger. Take a step back, find another way. I like to help out people, but I don't want them to take advantage from me. Not in such a rude way, but still. And I feel sometimes when I help out and doing some volunteering or something like as I think good, it's extremely devastating for me. And I don't know how, to, and then I need time to recover a lot. I want to find some, some way to help people without such damage to me. How to find it? Being helpful does not mean that you are naive. Being compassionate does not mean that you are weak. While you are helping, Keep your mind clear and think clearly. So being exposed to those people who are in need does not mean that you have to become super defensive, but it also doesn't mean that you become vulnerable. Vulnerability is the same problem as being defensive. See how you can help. Give them food, but don't let them eat your hand. Give them water to drink. Don't let them invade your life. This is just being very balanced, selfless, compassionate, as well as not so much vulnerable and not really believing their karma. Help their lives, help their minds, but do not follow their direction. Otherwise, you end up in the same way as they do. In this case, you have to ask a very clear question. What is it? that those people need who are asking for help. And you should see what they want as your help. It's never the same. So give them what they need, but you can barely give them what they want and sometimes you should not give them what they want. 
Consequently, you cannot depend on their opinions. Sometimes people have very strong opinions on someone who is trying to help them. Do not depend on that. Instead, see cause and effect very clearly. Did you really do what was necessary? And if you did that out of selfless and good motivation, without exhausting your resources, without hurting others, without damaging anything or anyone, that that intention was right, that motivation was correct. And whether you fulfill the purpose or not, you made one step to the right direction. But do not depend on people's words, dualistic thinking, extreme emotions, and irrelevant feedbacks. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing uh, your time uh, with us today, coming for this Dharma talk and being present. I sincerely hope that uh, from time to time we can meet again, share the Dharma again, and make another step towards attaining clarity and saving all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.